Good evening and welcome to this week, a weekly news review program. I'm your host, Tanra Rambatar. And for our top stories for this week, we have The US and Mongolia convened the first child protection compact partnership bilateral dialogue. Prime Minister of Mongolia, Oyir, met with the CEO, Friyan Tinto. And for the news, stay tuned. The Mongolia and United Arab Emirates Business Forum took place on November 17, 2021, as part of the Expo 2020 Dubai, a global expo being held in Dubai. The forum was co-organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mongolia, the National Development Agency, Mongolian National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and the Federation of United Arab Emirates Chambers of Commerce and Industry to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Mongolia and the United Arab Emirates. Member of Parliament Bolton Toya also noted that cooperation between the countries is mostly taking place in the electricity, environmental, healthcare, and education sectors, and stressed the importance of strengthening cooperation and the joint commitment of business enterprises for the expansion of trade and economic relations. The director of the Foreign Trade and Economic Cooperation Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mongolia, Ulti Sechen, presented opportunities for investment in Mongolia and major projects and programs that could improve economic cooperation and the business environment. 70 entities from Mongolia and the United Arab Emirates attended the event and exchanged views on prospects for cooperation. Dubai is one of the largest centers of business, banking, finance, and logistics in the world. A large number of transnational corporations operate in Dubai. The COVID-19 pandemic has raised concerns about children's mental health, but the pandemic may just be uncovering the tip of a mental health iceberg that we have ignored for far too long. UNICEF's State of the World's Children 2021 report examines child, adolescent and caregiver mental health. It focuses on risk and protective factors at critical moments in the course of life and delves into the social determinants that shape mental health and well-being. The report calls for commitment, communication and action as part of comprehensive approach for promoting good mental health for every child, protecting vulnerable children and caring for children facing the greatest challenges. According to the State of World's Children 2021, UNICEF's most comprehensive look at the mental health of children, adolescents and caregivers in the 21st century, even before COVID-19, children and young people carried the burden of mental health conditions without significant investment in addressing them. According to the latest available estimates globally, more than one in seven adolescents aged 10 to 19 is estimated to live with a diagnosed mental disorder. Almost 46,000 adolescents die from suicide each year, with suicide being among the top five causes of death for their age group. Meanwhile, wider gaps persist between mental health needs and mental health funding. The report finds that globally about 2% of government health budgets are allocated to mental health spending. The latest data from UNICEF shows that Mongolia has an adolescent suicide rate that is five times higher than the average in the East Asia and Pacific region. Suicide as the cause of death among adolescents aged 10 to 14 has increased dramatically from 3.3% in 2003 to 11.4% in 2019. In 2018, 30.5% of adolescents experienced emotional and behavioral problems and 9% of them were dealing with emotional and behavioral disorders. There is limited availability of quality, adolescent-friendly mental health and psychological counseling services to meet the increasing demand for such services from children and their families. Moreover, there is a need to support the education system in building transferable skills in adolescents to help make them less vulnerable to mental health risks. Another issue is that 82% of children in Mongolia have access to the internet and the most popular social media platform is Facebook, with 85% of children stating that they have one or more accounts. According to a recent survey, 90% of the children surveyed said that they had access to inappropriate content online. Children fall back on self-help in the face of significant cultural impediments to reporting issues to their parents in the form of shame, fear, and the traditional disregard of children's voice and agency. As a result, 60 to 70 percent of the sexual images or content they are exposed to goes unreported. According to data from the National Center for Missing and Exploited,
exploited children. There were about 4,300 child sexual abuse and exploitation materials that were traded or shared in Mongolia. Currently, Mongolia has no strong legal framework for enforcing the obligations of Internet service providers to report the transmission of illegal materials. Prime Minister of Mongolia Oyrta met with Jacob Stausholm, CEO of Rio Tinto, and other company representatives regarding the Oyototra project. During the meeting, the Prime Minister stressed the need to ensure the implementation of Parliament Resolution No. 92 issued in 2019 on ensuring Mongolia's interest in the development of the Oyototra deposit and to achieve certain results in negotiations. The Prime Minister noted that Rio Tinto should be held accountable for the delays in the development of Oyototra's underground mine, that it should finance the project's additional costs, that it should cancel 34% of Mongolia's debt, and that Mongolia should be able to receive dividends from the project. Rio Tinto representatives said that they will focus on the immediate termination of the controversial Dubai Agreement or the Oyotalra Underground Mine Development and Financing Plan and will ensure that the Oyotalra project is implemented in a mutually beneficial manner that is in the best interest of the Mongolian people. Jacob Staussholm, CEO of Rio Tinto, expressed his readiness to focus on operations in Mongolia and to work together as transparently as possible to take cooperation based on mutual trust to a new level. Prime Minister Ayurdam previously held an online meeting with the newly appointed CEO of Rio Tinto in December 2020 when the Prime Minister was serving as the head of the Cabinet Secretariat. Nimbatar, the Minister of Justice and Home Affairs, is currently chairing the government working group established to ensure the implementation of Parliament Resolution No. 92. The third international shop and piano competition concluded in Ulaanbaatar on Monday with a gala concert. The competition was carried out in stages over two months, with participation from around 50 contestants from eight countries. Winners were announced during the gala. There are over 60 competitions around the world held in tribute to the renowned Polish pianist Friedrich Chopin. This year, the third edition of Mongolia's International Chopin Piano Competition was held by the Mongolian State Conservatory in collaboration with the Polish Embassy in Ulaanbaatar. The competition also commemorated the 70th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Poland and Mongolia. We have been honored to receive positive feedback from our international and local supporters for organizing the third edition of the Chopin competition in Mongolia. We are happy to introduce works by Mongolian composers through the competition as well. Also, we are happy that our competition is gaining recognition in Asia. We are planning to host the competition once every four years. The third Chopin competition was held from October 1st to November 22nd in Ulaanbaatar. Due to pandemic restrictions, the competition was organized in a combined online and in-person format for the first time. Around 50 international participants competed this year from eight countries, including Poland, Germany, Russia, Turkey, Spain, China, South Korea, and Mongolia. The competition jury consisted of international judges. Wojciech Świtała from the Friedrich Chopin Institute in Warsaw was the main judge. During the gala concert held on November 22nd, the winners of the two age categories were announced. The Grand Prix award went to Arunzaya Jarasehen, a graduate of Mongolian State Conservatory, who is currently studying in South Korea. The MNB World team had the chance to interview the first and third prize winners in the youth category. For the competition, I tried to practice smart, not hard. I played on stage for the second round and it was a bit frightening after the long pandemic hiatus. It was my first major competition. Now I'm more motivated to improve my skills in the future. While I was practicing, I tried to imagine the composer's feelings about the composition and how I can interpret them through my own feelings and present it to the listeners. To me, Chopin's compositions are very sentimental. Even his grander works include the elements of tenderness. During practice, I heard a lot of about music history and concert experiences from my teacher. The on and off pandemic lockdowns that continued for two years created major challenges for the arts and culture industry in Mongolia. The competition organizers happily noted that they managed to overcome these hardships and continued the country's musical legacy by expanding ties with international organizations. 
International scholars and lawyers attended a conference on the topic of legal issues and human rights violations committed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of them agreed that fundamental human rights guaranteed by the Constitution have been violated during the pandemic. The legal conference lawyers discussed the human rights violations caused by COVID-19 restrictions. In particular, it's the start of the pandemic Mongolia's National Emergency Commission implemented the decision to isolate repatriated citizens for a period of 35 days, which many believe was an abuse of people's constitutional rights. A number of complaints about the length of isolation were sent to the National Human Rights Commission, and four cases have made it to the Supreme Court. According to the Constitution, if human rights are to be altered in any way, an applicable law should be approved or relevant amendments should be made to an existing law. A temporary law on COVID-19 prevention, combating COVID-19 and the mitigation of its socioeconomic impact was approved and is enforced until the end of the year. In the law, it was stated that if the rights of citizens are restricted, there should be an adequate reason and the restriction must be appropriate for the situation and committed to protect the public and the rights and health of others. In addition, it is stated that the restrictions on certain human rights should be made at a minimum level and that there are fundamental human rights that should never be violated. Since the start of the pandemic, many cases of human rights violations have been recorded all over the world. Discussions at the conference focused on what should be done in the future to avoid violating the human rights guaranteed by the law. Lawyers and scholars from eight countries on four continents, including Mongolia, Japan, the USA, South Korea, Australia, China and Estonia, are participating in the conference. It was noted that the pandemic situation has been similar all around the world, and no country has come up with an ideal solution for solving the legal issues caused by the pandemic. In addition to human rights violations, there is also the issue of uncertainty in resuming the normal operations of government functions. In the past two years, 326 complaints of human rights violations related to COVID-19 restrictions were submitted to Mongolia's Human Rights Commission. Government officials and civil society organizations from the United States and Mongolia held a virtual bilateral dialogue today to share accomplishments and to discuss progress and challenges toward achieving objectives and completing activities under the U.S.-Mongolia Child Protection Compact Partnership signed in April 2020. The dialogue centered on the achievements and challenges participants and partner organizations faced in the first year of meeting the CPC partnership's objectives of strengthening efforts to effectively prosecute and convict child traffickers, to provide comprehensive trauma-informed and victim-centered care for child victims of these crimes, and prevent all forms of child trafficking in Mongolia. Through the partnership, Mongolia has pledged to make combating human trafficking a higher priority to expand its support for shelters for trafficking victims, to enhance victim-centered investigations and prosecutions, and to establish multidisciplinary task force to improve interagency coordination on victim identification, protection, and the investigation and prosecution of child trafficking crimes. Participants included U.S. Ambassador Michael Klechewski, Acting Director of the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons, Dr. Kari Johnstone, and the Government of Mongolia's Head of the Secretary of Coordination Council for Crime Prevention, Nim Giril Lamtagmet. Ambassador Klechewski provided remarks and affirmed that the United States remained committed to the success of the partnership. He noted the partnership exists because of the strong joint commitment the United States and Mongolia have made to combat child trafficking, and it has the potential to make a real and enduring difference in children's lives. In 2020, the U.S. government invested 5 million U.S. dollars in foreign assistance to World Vision, the Asia Foundation, and local partners in Mongolia to support the goals and objectives of the CPC partnership. During the dialogue, Dr. Johnston noted that U.S. recently provided an additional 500,000 U.S. dollars to the consortium to expand on its activities in support of the partnership. The Asia Foundation's project for enhancing and strengthening women's economic capacity has been supporting women entrepreneurs operating in local regions. As part of the project, the first local business center for women was opened in Orhanga province on November 22nd. Women's economic potential cannot be measured just by labor market engagement only. 
The Asia Foundation's project seeks to strengthen women's economic capacity by addressing a wide range of issues that women are facing, including domestic violence, child care responsibilities, unpaid work, as well as sexual harassment at the workplace. The Asia Foundation resident representative emphasized that the most important thing for women in business was community support. In addition to the community, women also need intensive training from their business partners to improve their skills. The opening of the center will reduce unpredictable risks encountered by women entrepreneurs, further develop their business skills, increase their self-confidence and lay the foundation for positive participation in the labor market. In 2019, Urhanga province implemented a program to support women's employment and started operating a business incubator center, which is one of the foundation stones for a women's business center. Through the Women's Entrepreneurship Empowerment Program, they will be empowered and included in business incubator services. In addition, Urhanga province is in a unique situation by having a positive environment for organizing sales and merchandise activities through sales centers. In the future, we will focus on working with financial institutions. We also made a presentation on how to increase engagement of the Department of Commerce and Industry, as well as NGOs that support women entrepreneurs and civil society organizations. There are many opportunities for women entrepreneurs. You need to contact this center for information. For example, there is a guarantee loan fund and there are programs and projects of low-interest bank loans. We expect many opportunities will be available through this center. The training event was provided to women entrepreneurs during the pandemic. Women entrepreneurs from Ulaanbaatar and four provinces such as Umungov, Kovalta and Urhanga attended the training sessions. This training was a great opportunity for participants to network and to learn from each other. After the training, I knew that the Asian Development Fund will be providing 500 U.S. dollar scholarship for women entrepreneurs. As of today, I have learned from my teachers how to apply for this scholarship. The center will provide women with training and the knowledge of how they need to run a successful business. It will also support their business and expand their sales via various channels. Well, that's all for this week. We'll see you next week with more news and updates. Have a nice weekend. Goodbye.